We're in Ballroom C. I am Jeremy Zawadny. I'm here to talk about, uh, well, the original title of my talk was Modernizing Legacy Pearl Serving Millions Daily. And I will talk some about that. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's uh, been interesting to be at the Pearl Conference so far, and I hope you, uh, you've enjoyed some of the presentations you've been to as well. If, uh, if you have questions as I'm going along, feel free to raise your hand uh, if you need to interrupt me or whatnot. I, uh, I'm not opposed to that. Uh, I'm fine with this being audience participation. In fact, I'll have some questions for you. Um, so a brief bit about who I am. Um, I don't know most of the people here, and you probably don't know me. So um, my experience has been I'm, I've been at Craigslist now for about 10 years, um, worked a lot in Pearl there in previous jobs. Um, I was at Yahoo for eight and a half years or so before that, did a lot of Pearl there as well. I was at a company called Marathon Oil before that, and uh, did Pearl stuff there as well. And uh, so I've been doing Pearl for um, a long time. <laughs> I, I, I figured it out. I started with Pearl back in about 1994. And um, this was an interesting presentation for, for me to put together because it made me, uh, this is the first time I put together a presentation. I was like, man, I'm starting to feel old. This this is weird. Um, <laughs> the um, the uh, most of it has been back-end infrastructure type work and, and it's often Perl in conjunction with other things. It's been like Perl with MySQL or Perl with uh, Sphinx or Redis or MongoDB or various other things that I, I don't even remember anymore. Um, I did write a book for O'Reilly years ago called High Performance MySQL. There's a tiny picture of it over there. Some of you may have seen that. Um, thank you. Uh, if you ever get the idea to write a book, my, my advice is don't. Um, I was given that advice by someone who wrote a book and actually was my first manager at Yahoo. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I kind of ignored that. Um, it, was, it was an interesting experience. It was one of those things where they always tell you that uh, the best way to convince yourself that you really know a topic well is to try to teach it to someone else and writing a book is like that. Uh, you get part way down the road and then realize how little you actually know. Um, anyway. I, uh, for fun, I also, I fly airplanes, so those are pictures of some of the airplanes I fly, because uh, everything can't be about programming all the time. Um, a couple other things about me and this talk. Um, I, I don't claim to be a particularly great programmer or anything like that, um, but I've been at it a while, and I do really like Perl. That's why I've been using Perl for... Uh, 20 some years now um, and it's um, it's really more the idea that I've I've been doing this long enough and I've talked to other people that have been doing this stuff long enough that uh, I've seen a lot of things and I've done a lot of things myself and I made a bunch of mistakes and often had to fix them or fix other people's mistakes too and um, and part of it is kind of looking back and going kind of how did things get where we are today and uh, what, what did I learn along the way um, and I suspect that a number of you in the room could probably add to the, some of the things I'll talk about as well. Um, so really the title for this talk could have been um, 20 years of Pearl for Internet stuff and, and, and some of the things I and others have learned along the way, because that's kind of what this is. Um, I didn't know that when I started putting it together. Um, also, I was told that there were certain things I wasn't supposed to talk about, so I had to take them out, and it kind of changed the talk a little bit. So uh, that happens sometimes, too. Um, uh, so a lot of this stuff is my opinion, um, but it's opinion born out of experience and uh, not necessarily opinion that's always been the same. It's, you know, I, th I think things are a certain way or I've had certain ideas and then I go along and I, I build something or I fix something or I fail at something and then I, I change my opinions on that topic and I think that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, so I'm sure many other folks in the room have different opinions and that's great and we may hear some of them today as well. Um, you know, Pearl's used in a lot of different contexts, a lot of different ways by a lot of different people, and I'm just going to be talking from a certain point of view. Um, if you're interested in a talk that has a lot of code in it, this isn't the one today. Uh, I suggest going next door because that one looks really interesting, and that's probably where I'd be if I wasn't here right now. Um, so to continue the, the idea of dating myself a little bit, uh, out of curiosity, I was trying to, rem I, I struggled with this, trying to remember, like, the first Pearl conference. I remember, I think I was at the first Pearl conference. It was either the first one or the second one. I was pretty sure it was the one in 1997. And, um, and I looked at that last night and I was like, oh crap, that was 20 years ago. Wow, okay, things have, things have been going on a while and, and have really come a long way. How many of you in the room were at that conference? Okay, Randall was there, I'm not surprised because <laughs> I saw him speak there. <laughs> um, so, okay. I have other questions then. So this is audience participation time. Um, so 
First of all, how many of you use Perl primarily for work? Hands up. And keep your hands up if you use it mainly for hobby stuff. And if you use it for work and hobby stuff. Okay, okay, that's, that's kind of what I expected. Um, so now we'll do the Perl experience. Um, if you've been using Perl for two or more years, put your hand up. Five or more years. 10 or more years. 15 or more years. 20 or more years. 25 or more years. Okay, I'm not, I'm talking to people like me, it seems then, okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll just all reminisce for an hour here. <laughs> um, another, another interesting question is what, I'm curious about the ages of like the code base that you primarily have to work in. If there's like a primary ball of Perl code you have to maintain, and I'm sure that's the case for a number of people if you work full time at a company. Uh, if that ball of code you're maintaining is five or more years old in general, 10? 15, 20, okay, this will be interesting. Um, uh, ra raise your hand if you can easily use CPAN modules at work. And now raise your hand if you can't. That's good, so there's only a few people that can't, that probably work in like strict banks or government jobs or something Cento crazy. <laughs> hey, we're on CentOS 7 and we're okay. Or is it six? I think we're on six. <laughs> anyway, that was a story from earlier today. Um, so how many of you are um, how many of you are using Perl, but you're also programming other languages at the same time? So you're sort of polyglot. And how many of you are pretty much Perl most of the time? Okay, that's that's actually not too surprising either. Um, and are you primarily working on what I'd call user-facing stuff? Hands up. And how many of you are doing more back-end stuff that people don't directly interact with? Okay, wow, that's. Um, I guess I shouldn't be surprised at that if you've been doing it that long because uh, in my experience, Perl started in the back end and kind of worked its way forward. Um, and how many of you are working on things that are sort of live systems that something else is interacting with or depending on and doesn't run just in the middle of the night? Okay, good, great. Um, this is almost redundant then to ask, but how many of you are involved in the task of maintaining and or updating old Perl code? As you think of, okay, all of us are doing that. All right, <laughs> uh, good to know. So um, this is one last thing, just like my little history. So I'm sure several of you, many of you had similar experiences. I grew up on computers. Like I had the Commodore 64, I played with Ataris and Amigas and all that stuff. Did the FidoNet thing, I kind of installed Linux from Slackware on floppy disks and in my bedroom and all that, and then uh, got internet access in high school, and um, you know, it all went downhill from there. Um, I, I actually learned Perl uh, for fun in college because uh, a sysadmin I knew recommended it, and then I got hired to do sysadmin and Perl stuff, and I've been doing Perl stuff for hire ever since then, so um, it didn't, didn't take long to get hooked on it, and uh, that's kind of where I've been. How many of you remember Matt's script archive? <laughs> Someone still uses it, they said? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> who walked out of the time capsule? Um, okay, so for those of you that don't know, there was this uh, website way, way back in the early days of the web called Matt's script archive. Um, and it was a place, it, it became like the place people went when they wanted to make a quote dynamic element on their website, like a feedback form or something like that. Um, and it, I just thought I'd, I decided to bring that up because I was trying to think through what the early time was, was like. Um, there was a very popular script called FormMail that um, was very, very, very popular and also um, widely ridiculed for being insecure uh, because it was. Um, you could. You could do all sorts of interesting things with it. But um, I'll talk more about this in a little while, but I, I, just, I, I was looking it up, I, you know, I was on the Wayback Machine to find that, and I was like, oh, I wonder if form mail's still around. It is. Um, I was amazed, there was a new release. Version 1.93 came out, it was July of 2009. Um, <laughs> which I was like, okay, that was eight years ago. Um, but this, stuff, this stuff's still out there to some degree. Um, so anyway, We've got this sort of evolution that happened. I, I was thinking back from the beginning of this, kind of where, where were things that back in that time frame and where was Pearl in the picture? Well, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, whatever, however you want to kind of put that time frame, you know, Pearl was kind of a new kid on the block in terms of 
programming. It wasn't something a lot of people knew, but thanks to the web, it became very popular um, because back then all the web stuff was basically a text processing job and Perl was really good at text processing. Um, it, was, it was better than the old awk and said command line tools because it was kind of, it was a language you could write real programs in with structure and libraries and eventually modules and eventually object oriented programming and it kind of continued to evolve. Um, you know, it was as simple back then as, as pulling in CGI lib or the CGI module later on and, and spitting out some HTML and, and there you know, you had, a, you had something you could, you could point a web server or you could, you could have on a web server, point a browser at it and uh, you were doing web programming. It wasn't, wasn't that hard, Perl made it really easy. In fact, for a long time, it was sort of called the duct tape of the internet back when you know, HTML was the bulk of what people were doing, converting from some format, whether it was a database or a CSV file or some weird proprietary corporate thing, um, because people wanted to see it in a web browser now. You know? The boss came along and said, take that old thing and make a web interface for it. And that's a lot of what Perl was used for. Um, and I did a fair share of that myself. Um, you know, back then, we made fun of PHP because PHP wasn't a real language. Uh, funny thing is nowadays there's a lot of PHP out there too and it's, uh, it's evolved quite a bit in the last 20 years too. Uh, it's kind of interesting to, to look at the two. Um, I, you know, back in, this was a screenshot from, from Amazon. I actually bought this book back in apparently November of 1997. Uh, it was called Database Backed Websites by a guy named Phil Greenspun. Uh, how many of you either read this or at least know who he is? Okay, so a few of you did. This was a book that back then for me, at the point I was at, it kind of just kind of blew my mind open. It was the idea of, of taking relational databases, which I didn't know anything about at the time. So it was kind of funny that I ended up writing a book about one later on. But I didn't really understand them. I didn't know anything. I didn't take any classes about them in school. They were optional. And it, honestly, when you're in college and they say there's a class on databases, it's an elective, I'm, I sound boring. So I didn't, didn't take that. What was I ever gonna do with a database? Um, so I sort of taught myself after reading this book, and the whole idea of building websites that were exposing structured data, letting users search that data, edit that data, update that data, filter through it, and all that kind of stuff, to me seemed like that was amazing. That was the kind of thing I wanted to work on. And this book, even though it had nothing to do with Perl, uh, it, it kind of set in my mind, uh, it, it showed me how this could be done with a, pro with a programming language or a scripting language. Um, and, uh, and so that really, it was interesting to go back and look and figure out when I got this, because I was trying to piece together the history in my mind. I was like, oh yeah, I was, I was 97, that makes sense. And um, it was one of those, you know, back in the early days of the web, it was, a lot of people had these stories of, oh, I, the day I saw this one thing, I just suddenly realized, oh, this is gonna be a big thing, that's gonna be a big thing, you know. The first time I ever bought something online with a credit card, I was like, wow, this e-commerce thing could really happen. You know, all, all these kinds of things that, uh, that we went through. So things went on for a while and we kind of ended up in this, this sort of middle time, um, which I kind of think of as the sort of the, the heyday of Pearl on the web or, or maybe the peak of it, uh, depending who you talk to. And it was a time when, um, you know, in the sort of middle 2000s, we were at a point where Pearl was being used pretty much everywhere for, for web stuff. Uh, there were jobs posted all the time looking for Pearl people. Um, CPAN really took off as a result of this because not only did we have a lot more people doing Perl, the web itself made CPAN an accessible thing. You could go to CPAN, you could browse, you could search, you could download, you could look at module source code, all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of this nice positive feedback loop where the web made it easier for getting Perl code, Perl modules, and collaborating on Perl, and Perl itself was powering all the stuff that made it possible to build the web, so it was, it was a really nice feedback loop that got going. And um, other languages, of course, were coming along at this time, saw CPAN and, and copied it or, or took the same idea and used it to inspire something else, which is great because that meant it became kind of a, a standard feature for, for languages that folks wanted to do web development in was, it's not just a language, it's not just a language and a bunch of libraries that, that, that have all this stuff that we need. It's a language, a bunch of built-in libraries, and then a way for the community to sort of gather all this other third-party modules that people are creating and distribute them as well. So it was a level up from, from where we'd ever been before. You know, before CPAN, really, the only way you got code online was to go to some FTP site and that you heard about from someone else or found in, um, in an email list or something like that. And it was, it was, a, completely different, uh, it was a completely different time and a comp completely different way of sharing software. 
So I, you know, I have to give Perl a lot of credit for that in the Perl community because CPAN was kind of revolutionary at the time. Um, and then, of course, we had the LAMP stack. And, and the P in the LAMP stack changed depending on, you know, on who the programmer was. Sometimes it was Perl, sometimes it was Python, sometimes it was PHP. But the sort of basic architecture of how web applications were built back then um, kind of took on a very familiar shape. In fact, sometimes the M wasn't even MySQL. Sometimes it was Postgres. Again, it depended who it was. But um, this, this sort of... A sort of framework was, was set up and, and widely copied and used all over the place. And, uh, and Perl continued to evolve too. We got, we got, uh, we got things like FastCGI and ModPerl. And you know, ModPerl was amazing when that came out. It was just like, wow, I can, make, I can have Perl as almost the web server itself. And suddenly you could build applications that we, we never even thought of before because everything was just CGI before that, which was, was slow. And you could only do so much on a single host. Uh, so. And in where we are now, well, now we're in a completely different time again. Um, you know, most people out in the general world of, of programming and, and building stuff on the web think Perl's a legacy language. Um, there's a lot of, you know, old Perl code around. And, and I confirmed that, right? We all put our hands up when we talked about 10-year-old and 15-year-old co code bases. And um, the thing about it is, though, that code is, is actually really important and in most cases works. Um, and, you know, we've got all this, this change going on in the world of technology and in the business world and have to adapt. And, and I, you know, the, the example that came to mind when I was thinking about this was the Mojolicious framework for building web apps. How many of you have used or tried it for anything? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it was interesting because this is one of those ones when I, when I first tried it, I was like, huh, this is like just, it felt like it felt like some, and it, it wasn't completely new, but it felt like something completely new had come to Perl for me. And I was like, wow, this is kind of nice. It felt like a little bit of rejuvenation. Um, so what are some of the things that are, that are changing? What has changed in the last five or 10 years that, that, that we, we as people who have to maintain large code bases of Perl have to adapt to? Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff, honestly. It's, it's the fact that, that you know, Everyone wants a web API. Well, they've wanted web APIs for years, but now there's even better reasons for wanting these APIs. Uh, well, we want to build mobile apps to run on phones that hit these APIs and access the same data that we were building HTML forms for 10 and 15 years ago. Um, more and more now I'm hearing that lots and lots of shops are just multi-language. Um, it's very, it, it seems to me, my experience has been a lot less common to find companies now that are like, we're going to hire you, we do Perl, that's it. No, it's like, well, we do some Perl, we do some Go, we do some Python, we do some JavaScript, or we do some Objective-C for this, we do some <laughs> Python for that, we do some Perl for this. So there's a lot more mixing of languages going on because either different languages have their different strengths or different teams prefer different languages for the things they're working on. So we're in an environment now where you have to play well with others, which, which is great. I mean, Perl's actually really good at that as long as the people are good at that. Um, we've got a lot more frameworks nowadays for building web systems. Uh, many of these, you can pick any language on this list, go online and probably find five or 10 frameworks, and I'm talking popular ones, not obscure little frameworks that only five people use, um, for building applications. Um, the way software is being, is being deployed has been changing too. It's no longer the case that, this thing's been falling. Very slowly, it's going down. Maybe it, when it hits the floor, I'm done. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the, so the way the way software is being um, packaged, distributed, uh, managed, monitored, run, all that stuff is changing now. I mean, when you know the the, the big thing that happened years ago, um, I think the watershed moment for a lot of people was was when Amazon Web Services first came out. Uh, how many how many of you are, are building stuff on Amazon Web Services these days? And how many of you would have thought that when it first came out? I know a lot of people looked at it and they were like, oh, that's interesting. And a lot fewer people were like, oh, that's what I need. I want to stop dealing with all these servers and crap and whatever. And nowadays, it seems like a lot more stuff is being built there first uh, on or other cloud services now that we've got so many others that have come along. Um, but that, that, you know, that has ripple effects into all sorts of things, uh, especially for a language where there's a lot of older code. A lot of older assumptions have to change too. Um, so... Uh, I mentioned talked about interoperability. Um, concurrency has become a much bigger deal for um, for building things nowadays that talk on the internet or talk on the web because we've got 
we've got this notion of, of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of sometimes persistent network connections. They're persistent, but mostly idle sometimes because of things like mobile apps and APIs or lots of other things that you're talking to. It's very common now to be talking to lots of other services and lots of other machines. And that, that kind of changes the way you program. Uh, the talk I just came out of was about event-driven programming, and, and that's a world a lot of people have kind of had to move into um, in Perl and in other languages just, just to build things. Um, you know, we, when we've got CDNs, for example, CDNs weren't really a thing for a long time, except for, you know, maybe Akamai was the only one people had heard of a long time ago. And now we've got lots of CDNs, and, and you know, they've, as, they alone have gotten a lot more complicated, and they have APIs that you need to be able to talk to. Um, and, you know, the last thing is sort of the business interest in, in uh, the business interest in having, having web applications that uh, perform a certain way that can be uh, maintained to a certain uh, degree of security and responsiveness and uptime and all those things that people care about, especially when your, your business depends on these things for making money. Um, so all this stuff is different. Um, so... What a lot of us in the room are probably doing is, and I, I, I put up some of the analogies that people often use. You know, there's, it's like you're, you're sort of changing tires on the race car while it's still moving or updating the airplane engines in flight or, you know, whatever. We're working with working things, things that are being used on a daily basis, things that have been alive for a long time and grown organically and trying not to break them. And at the same time, we're, we're trying to sort of modernize stuff. We're trying to put bits of the future in there without, with, without breaking the past and keeping the past stuff working uh, and improving things along the way. Um, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very delicate task in some cases, uh, and there's a lot of guesswork involved. And um, a lot of this isn't even Perl specific. It's just that, well, we're at a Perl conference, and a lot of us in the room are, are, are dealing with the same thing, I think. So um, why this matters, I think we talked about some of this. I mean, there's a lot of uh, well-aged Perl code out there. Um, you know, I, my guess is that most of the Perl code that will ever be written has already been written, um, just because so much was written in the last 15 years. Uh, I'd be happy to be wrong about that, but just the way things have been trending and the proliferation of other languages, uh, I don't know. Uh, a lot of newer companies aren't choosing Perl. That's just a simple fact. Um, they, they may choose other languages. They may have, there, there may be Perl systems they choose and need to work with and need to integrate. Um, but that may not be what they're choosing for new development. Uh, the good news is I think Perl can play very well with others. Um, but it's an, we all know it's an incredibly flexible language. Um, that's good and bad. Um, I think that, that we all know that flexibility can be uh, used and abused and overused in some cases. And that's something to think about. Um, I think... Um, well, I'll talk more about that. So, you know, a lot of this old Perl code is, is, is mission critical stuff. It is stuff that, that so many other things depend on. And, um, and in some cases is, is grown in this weird organic way such that uh, what you find is, is you've got lots of things in an organization that are, that are several steps removed from the actual code you're working on that all, de that all depend on things behaving in a certain way. And, um, and that becomes challenging. So, um, you know, one of the things to think about in this work, in this, in this process of maintaining old Perl code, updating it, restructuring it, is, is how, we're, how we keep Perl relevant, how we keep Perl uh, relevant and actually keep it approachable and maintainable. And, um, you know, one of the ways to think about this, I think, is when, when you've got a manager, a decision maker at a company trying to just looking at something and just having to decide, you know, are we going to scrap that thing and rewrite it in something else? Or are we going to continue to invest and update it? Uh, they, have to, they have to think about that. And I'm actually going to ask this question for, for folks in the room now. What sorts of things do you think run through their mind when they're, when they're trying to decide that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, if you follow what happened with COBOL, you have fewer and fewer COBOL programmers, but there were so many millions of dollars invested in the infrastructure, it, it became this, like, we need to find COBOL programmers and pay them anything they want. Right, right. So you... Right. The, the scarcity of programmers eventually drives the price up so high that you can't deal with it anymore. Sure. Um, so so you, you're saying cost in the long run is a factor, right? Long-term long cost. cost. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. So I have to make that decision for our company, and it comes down to human resources. Okay. Right. 
you have to be able to get people, which means it's, 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 that's the shortage is being able to hire people that either know Perl or are willing to learn Perl, right? Yes? Um, we have to look a lot at the other languages that all of the other tools are implemented in because we started out as primarily a Perl shop, but then we want to use RabbitMQ, that's in Erlang. We want to use uh, something with WebSockets that means usually no JS or Python. Uh, and once you start to spread that out away from being mostly a one language shop, you have to reevaluate which languages you're going to use. You don't want to use absolutely every other language out there. Right. Yeah. So that that's a good point too. Is, is is once you go from being a single language shop to being multi language, you have to start making tough choices about how many languages and then how you choose which language makes the most sense for a given project. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, if you want to go into that type of system, you can say, well, you know, we can't use Pro you know, because they're not they're not Pro oriented. Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to run into a roadblock at some point where we're not going to be able to continue. Let's do it in Python. So yeah, so that's a good point. When you're looking, if 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 part of what you do is is you look at if you have to integrate with a lot of third party APIs, whether it's some cloud service provider for you know messaging and telephony or email delivery or hosting your application or whatever it is, yeah, do, do, they, do they support, is there a first class support for the language you want, Perl in this case? Good point, yes. So enterprise security scanning tools like static analysis tools are tools which are required in a lot of contracts and a lot of ways to do business with banks. Uh, any kind of performance monitoring tools that are embedded into the language, it's very difficult to find Perl support for those things. That, that's another good point, yeah. Support, support for things that are either very, very useful in your organization or in some cases required by uh, contracts or agreements you have. Okay, anything else? Yes. Right. So the, the issue of library and module support, and, and I'd argue that's a, that, that actually applies to both internal modules and libraries as well as things on CPAN. Uh, it's not uncommon for things to become orphaned or for a maintainer to go have other interests and, and kind of hope someone else takes it over at some point. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Randall. Yeah, refactoring, yeah. Per, part of Perl's flexibility means that refactoring Perl code can be very tricky. Good point. Okay. Um, so, and the last point on here was think about why Matt's script archive and like form mail uh, took off way back when they did. And my argument is, this is an argument in favor of Perl, is one of the reasons I think a lot of us use it and one of the reasons that there's so much of it still around is it gets the job done. It's a language you can sit down and you can be productive and you can get shit done. And that's great. And that's, that's a really, that's a huge endorsement for Perl. It was back then and I think it still is today. And that's one of the reasons I still use it. It's the first thing I pull out when I need to build something. But the other thing you need to think about is can you build something in a way that uh, five years, or 10 years down the road, you're gonna be able to come back and still understand. And that's a whole other question, a whole other discipline. And I think there's a talk on that later today that I'm actually going to go to because I'm, I'm kind of curious because I've written code myself that I've gone back to a few years later and looked at and been like, what the hell was I doing? And just, you know, <laughs> trying to figure it all out. Everyone. Well, everyone does that, but some people to, to different degrees. That's not just Perl. No, it's not just Perl. It's not just Perl at all. Um, I think, you know, in my opinion, um, the issue with Perl, and I'm, I'll bring this up again in a, in a slide in a few minutes, is uh, I, I, there's the question about building code and structuring code and designing code in such a way that you can come back to it in five years or 10 years and understand it. And then taking that to the next level is, can someone who's relatively new to Perl understand your code five years after you wrote it? And that's when features of the language, features of the culture and community and practices around Perl also come into play. Um, that's, anyway, I'll, I'll bring that up again in, in a few minutes, but that, that's a good point. It's certainly not a Perl-specific problem. Um, 
So the other, the, other, the other big trend that we've been seeing, and this is kind of just another way of saying some of what we already talked about, is there's been a trend to go from sort of applications to services. This idea that you may have written the CGI thing 15 years ago, and then you migrated it to Mod Pearl five years later, and nowadays it's something that doesn't have an actual visual interface that you see because it's just an API endpoint for a mobile device or it's an API endpoint for some other service that's talking to it. And... Um, and that's had that's had impacts too, and kind of how we how we deal with code and the, and the concerns that we have. Um, you know, they've in, in some ways it's made things you know, easier to update and easier to test because if you don't have to deal with UI stuff, well, that's easier to test. It's it's certainly easier to update because you don't have any users complain to you about it. And it's like, why'd you move that button? I didn't. The button's gone. I don't deal with, deal with that anymore. Um, deployment tends to be different, especially if you've moved to an environment where you're not owning the server as you're not on bare metal anymore. Um, they can be harder to monitor in some cases because um, when things start to act up, you don't know if it's your code or something that your code's interacting with when it's uh, one piece of lots of services that all interact with each other. And uh, it makes for more interesting failure cases. Um, I'm not gonna say that's better or worse, it's just more interesting. Um, and then, then the question of how you even draw boundaries about where responsibilities for things go. That, that tends to be more of an organizational problem, I think, in a lot of places, or a cultural issue. Um, so the sorts of growing pains um, or aging pains that we've, that we've probably seen um, in, in older and larger code bases of, of Perl code, and, and I think this becomes more apparent when new people join a project or move into it, um, often is you know, the lack of documentation. Yeah, that is not Perl specific either, of course, right? Uh, just read the code. Well, yeah, sure, as long as the code makes sense or was commented in a way that, that explained not just what you're doing but why you're doing it that way, uh, that information's often lost. But, um, and, you know, Perl's known for readability, so that, that's a bonus. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, there, there's, there's often a lack of tests. So uh, a lot of the code that I dealt with years ago, um, and I'm not going to say which companies because it doesn't matter. It's been the case everywhere I've worked. Um, there were no tests. You know, is, is the kind of thing where the only time I saw tests in Perl code was in CPAN modules. And, you know, even then, the early days of the, the CPAN stuff, it was, it was very, very, very basic stuff. There wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't, it wasn't the kind of extensive testing we see nowadays. So, you know, that transition has been great. But lack of tests on older code makes it challenging when you're going to go to try to change that code or update it in some way. Um, there's often a lack of good sort of interface boundaries or API boundaries on things because um, things have evolved over time. You know, the requirements when this was built 10 or 15 years ago are a lot different than nowadays. The expectations are different too. Um, and that means the way the code is structured is probably not optimal and the way that um, the way that it reacts to unexpected things may not be optimal either. Then um, there's an entire ball of wax that I won't talk too much about, but the whole idea of code that was designed assuming the world was ASCII when now we're in a Unicode world. Uh, how many of you have had to deal with that, that nightmare? Yeah, okay, a few people. <laughs> you, were you gonna say something, Randall? I was gonna say one other bullet point here is uh, scaling. When you, it's okay to repeat mm -hmm. one way of coding for 50,000 entries, but when you define a million entries, yeah. they may require entirely new strategy. That, that's a good point, yeah. Scaling as things get big, and, and many times we, we've run into the problem where well, this all made sense when the thing was designed and built 10 or 15 years ago. We only ever had 10,000 entries there. We only ever had to deal with 15 servers. And you know, as we've built things to handle data from more people, from more machines, from more services, those numbers all go up and, and, and restructuring that code sometimes just to deal with that particular problem, to deal with scaling needs, uh, that, that's a discipline in itself. Um, and it's not as simple as just running it under a profile and seeing where it's slow because sometimes it's not the code that's the problem. It's the structure of the code, it's the assumptions it makes, it's how it stores and retrieves the data, so on down the list. Um, and the, the last one I'll mention, um, code as configuration. Um, how, many of you, how many of you where you work have uh, what are effectively config files that are actually evaluable Perl code? Yeah, so I hear a few people say not anymore. <laughs> so that's a bad reason for a few things. For there, so that's a bad idea for a few reasons. Um, the you know aside from the obvious security issues around that kind of thing um, and predictability issues, the you know the one that's been coming up for for me in recent years has been the whole. 
the whole notion of having to play well with others, having to having to have systems built in Perl and Python or Perl and JavaScript or Perl and other languages and all share some information with each other. Uh, when, you're, when your core configuration for something like how a sharding system is supposed to behave or how requests are supposed to be routed or uh, which machines are responsible for what data or business rules around charging people for certain things in certain ways, when that's expressed as a big Perl file, you've got a problem to solve. Um, and uh, and that's, that's just one of those things that has been, for, in my experience, has been a, a repeating annoyance when having to make systems talk to each other nicely because that's the first thing I see is, oh, I got that config file in Perl. I need to find a way to express that in something else and make sure the other code can understand it. And you end up having to build all this other structure around something that at the time seemed perfectly reasonable and probably was. But it's one of those growing pains that comes up. Um, <clears throat> oh, I sort of talked about this. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. Um, anyway, and this is, so even going to something like YAML or JSON or something that where there are at least parsers in other languages gets you sometimes 80, 90% of the way there. Um, and, uh, you know, I saw folks doing this years ago, even before there was this whole notion of service discovery and all these other systems that have, have come up over the last few years. And, and at the time seemed to me a little bit like overkill, but it turns out it was just uh, just sort of, it was getting ready for the future before it arrived, at least to, uh, in, in cases I was familiar with. Um, so there, there are big decisions when you're, when you're looking at code like this, you know, do you, either you or the person making these decisions has to think about this and you know replacing something entirely or updating it well that's that's kind of a time effort trade off or a time you know money effort trade off that someone has to make and and that that's a big one for a lot of folks um, another one is is there's a huge there's a huge <laughs> a lot of people get stuck on this you know do we do incremental refactoring this code base over the next 5 years or do we spend 3 years rewrite it and replace it a whole hog um First of all, both those estimates are going to be wrong. Um, <laughs> the new system's going to have different bugs than the existing one. We, we all know this, right? But it's trying to either internalize this when we're making our own decisions so that we can be logical and not emotional about it. That, that's hard sometimes when it's your code or it's code you either love or hate for various reasons. Or the, the business slash manager person above you has to be, um, has to have this explained so that they can help decide what makes sense. Um, it's, you know, they're fundamentally, whoever's making that decision is making, is having to understand or trying to understand what the risks involved in both of those are. Um, and then, then there's my favorite one, which is when you're doing the incremental refactoring is, is well, while I'm in here, I'm just going to fix this other stuff too. Uh, that happens, that happens to everyone, right? So it's that scope creep. It's like you're in some old code. It's just, oh gosh, you know, while I'm, it's, it's kind of like the national parks thing or when you go camping, you're supposed to, you know, pack it in, pack it out or try to leave an area better than when you got there. You know, a lot of people have that mentality with code. I have that mentality with code. I like to clean things up while I'm in there. But damn it, if I don't, occasionally break something doing that too. And it's just so annoying. But it's, it's one of those things. It's like you have to, you have to ex exercise restraint in some cases, but there are other times when it's really worth fixing it and, and knowing how to make that decision. That, that's, that's the hard thing here. Um, the good news for a lot of us in the room here is the impression I got when we were, we were raising hands earlier is a lot of us have been with these code bases for a long time. So we have, we have a bit of an understanding of what the implications might be of making certain changes. That's something that someone new to the code base isn't going to have. And that's something to think about, too. Um, so looking at my time here, I'm babbling longer than I thought. So, so talking about the code stuff, um, one of the big things, this is something that, that happens if you're doing that kind of incremental refactoring or trying to go from single to multi-language or so many other reasons this happens, is you end up adding complexity in order to simplify things. Sounds completely backwards, but you're able to justify it for some reason, right? Well, if I just add to do this other stuff, uh, this will all become easier. And there are times when this is totally justifiable and makes sense and you should do it. And then there's other times when you're just making more work for yourself, more stuff to support, and the real reason you want to do it is because you think it'll be fun. That ever happened? Yeah. A bunch of you are lying because you didn't put your hands up. <laughs> um, so... Um, Anyway, 
one of the things that ends up happening when, when you're bringing older code up to date is you end up adding sort of layers or wrappers around things to try to bring old data up to date. That, that's something that happens. And that, in my opinion, in my experience has been very justifiable and a very useful thing to do. Um, rather than access, always accessing this, this hash and going and getting the members of that hash directly, we're gonna add a wrapper class around it. So we're gonna make method calls on it. That way if we change the structure of the hash or change the hash keys, then the code doesn't break anymore. I and mean, that's a very common thing to do. And, and I think in a lot of cases is warranted because it gives you flexibility in the future to make changes and not have things break all the time. Um, that's something, I, there, there are rare cases of that where I've seen or heard about it being a waste. Uh, that, that seems very good. Another is adding sort of the notion of versioning to these objects so that uh, if you've got old data laying around that's not read very often, that when it is read, it can either be updated, upgraded on the fly, or it can be presented in such a way that it complies to the new interface that's been defined, even though the data is old and, and all the new code doesn't have to deal with understanding how to parse that old data, for example. Um, so there, there are some considerations that come up when you're doing this um, that I, I and others have encountered um, is, <laughs> is you might not make it complex enough. Um, and, and, you know, it, part of it is not getting the abstractions right and having weird things leak through those abstractions. Um, and what you realize is that to make a complete and fully usable version of what you thought was going to be an easy task is, is a job in and of itself and probably not one worth doing because um, it's going to take too long, too much effort, and then something has to be supported for a long time. Uh, the flip side of that is sometimes the creating this is really fun, so you convince yourself it's a good idea anyway. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and you're looking at it and going, well, you know what, I can actually do it the right way this time. I didn't do it the right way last time, I can finally get it right. Or the other, you know the person who created it, they're not the company anymore, well, I can finally fix that person's mistakes and I can make their stuff work the way it should. Um, the question is, you know, will, is your way the right way? Will it stand the test of time? Hard to say. And how useful is it going to be really compared to the amount of fun you're going to have creating it? And that's one of those things. It's, 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 it's hard to separate yourself from at times. Uh, I'll, give yourself, I'll give you some examples that I've either seen or heard of. Um, building your own query language for something. Who's done that here? Nobody? Oh, come on. All right, a few. I've done it. I mean, I, I'm in the process of trying to retire one. Um, you know, oh, it's just gonna be a subset of SQL because that's really all we need. Well, that's all you need today. As soon as something starts to feel like SQL, you expect it to have all of SQL in it, and then you're gonna spend the rest of your life adding those bits until you've recreated SQL. Um, or how many of you ever written a custom caching layer for something? Yeah, how many of you still have it? Some of you, okay. <laughs> um, sometimes that's warranted. Sometimes that's really what you need. Other times, uh, you can use something off the shelf and you'll get the job done just as well. And um, the difference is you're not creating new stuff yourself. It's, you don't get the same sense of satisfaction from it. Um, so that happens. Uh, how many of you have ever written your own domain-specific ORM for some data? Yeah? Are those fun in the short term? Yeah, they're fun in the short term. And then when you're maintaining them for the next decade, it's kind of like, oh, God, this again. Um, you know, again, it's one of those cases where I've seen, I've seen examples that are good because the data is very, very um, specific, has some really weird quirks about it that uh, what you really want to do is insulate most people from ever, ever having to understand all the int intricacies. Um, but in many, many, many cases, it's probably just it's overkill. It's, it's, it's adding complexity for, um, for fun and uh, ends up dragging you down in the future when you're trying to change things, trying to evolve things, and you've got to drag all this other baggage along with you. Um, what if we just set up a Hadoop cluster? Like I've seen that kind of thing before. What if I just pick off the shelf solution X? Let's just use that, where that is actually a really big hammer for a relatively small problem. Uh, that's another one that, that, that that happens with some frequency is someone sees a piece of technology that will solve a particular problem. It just the, the problem that you're trying to solve is this big and the solution for it is 50 times that. And you spend all your time and effort getting that thing set up uh, in order to solve a problem that, that would have been solved with a lot less effort. Um, and that's something I've, I thankfully haven't done that myself very often. I've done that a few times, um, but it's it's definitely one of the things where it, c it can be very tricky because um, 
The best thing to do early on is do some due diligence, talk to other people using whatever the thing is you're thinking of getting because you wanna get the real story on what it takes to, uh, to, to keep that thing and maintain it over the years. Uh, I've been surprised at times. Um, so kind of what do you do? Like, what do you do when you're, when you're in this process of, of pick, taking your old code and modernizing and are trying to do a big refactoring or, or, or maybe change things in, a, in a, an even different way? You know, I think the best thing to do a lot of times is just sort of step back and take a, take a deep breath and look at things, try to look at things objectively, especially if the code you're dealing with is your own. Um, we all feel pride of ownership or pride of creation uh, with code that we're dealing with. If it's something that we had a hand in or we were the primary person working on it for a long time. Um, always keep that question in the back of your mind is, you know, is what I'm about to do really helpful or is it just fun? Um, because the, the fact is, and a lot of us know this, many times in organizations, the programmer is doing things. If the managers above them aren't very technical, the manager doesn't know the difference. They don't know if what you're proposing is actually going to be beneficial to the company or if it's just fun for you. And it's kind of, the burden's kind of on you to, 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 um, to be honest about that and, um, and explain the trade-offs. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes there are things that, well, they will benefit the company, but it's fun for me too. And I, I'd like to, you know, it's, it's okay to use new technology to get on your resume once in a while. If that's the only reason you're using it, that's, you know, that's a whole different story. Um, so it really comes down to what, 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 is your, what does your business really need? And sometimes we know the answer to that as, as programmers, sometimes we don't, and it's worth having a conversation. Um, you know, hey, before I spend six months updating this thing, do you foresee any other changes a couple years down the road? Or is there even talk of creating an app for this thing or having an API on this thing or whatever? Uh, when you see new tech, you know, we're good at seeing new technology coming at us. We're not necessarily good at knowing whether our business is gonna use them. So sometimes even planting that seed in other people's minds and asking that question helps out a lot. Uh, there are a few times where that's, that saved me from working on a six month project that now I didn't, you know, I don't even have to touch it. Turns out that we didn't need to do it that way. Um, you know, proceed with caution. Um, never, never go into something uh, unwilling to stop and, and reassess where you're at and think about whether you're in, you're in the position you want to be in when you're, you're doing a big refactoring of something or, or um, doing things the same way they've been done for a long time if there may be a better way. Uh, and the other thing is less is more. If you're doing a lot of work in an old code base and you can get rid of things, do it. The most satisfying thing I ever do now is delete code. Just, yeah. Uh, we all know this, this uh, famous quote, right? Some people when confronted with a problem think, I know, I'll use regular expressions. Now they have two problems. Do a Google search of that now. I don't, it wouldn't matter whether you agree with that or not. What's funny is that my, my original manager at Yahoo, Jeffrey Friedel, who wrote the Regular Expressions book, he came across this years later and did an extensive research and write up on his blog, there's a link for it, of where that actually came from. And the comments on that blog post I thought were just really interesting to read. So I think it's interesting for that reason, but also it's the whole, the whole idea of, of trying, trying to choose the right tool for the problem and not just a tool that you either know or, or like for, for that sake. Um, I'm getting short on time, so I'm gonna go faster. Does Jeffrey believe in that? Uh, no. He doesn't believe in that, but, but he does have, there are some good comments. Read the discussion on his blog post. I think, I, I think he's, he's, um, he's very level-headed about it. Uh, he's not uh, religious about it, let's put it that way. <laughs> Um, so this is useful more to, I didn't know who was going to be in the room and like, I didn't know if a lot of people were going to be relatively new to Perl and dealing with old code and that kind of thing. So the question is like, if you're new to a Perl code base that you've been thrown into, kind of what do you do? How do you get the lay of the land? Uh, how do you know what's safe to change? Uh, this is not really specific to Perl, but, uh, kind of what do you, there's so many ways, so many things you can do. Uh, you can read the, the documentation. If there is any, read the code, add the print statements. There's DIY things you can build. Uh, you can add stats and counters to things. If we've got you know, network type services, uh, those are really useful. If you wanna know how many times certain methods are called and things like that, you can look at coverage and profiling tools to help you out there. You can grab the code base or you can comment it out and see if the thing still works. Um, test suites, um, I could talk more about this. There's not a lot of time, but the, the basic idea here is the most important thing on the slide was think about how you can test for unintended consequences to changes. A lot of times you can't, but that's the thing you should worry about in the back of your mind when you're changing things, especially if it's code you don't know well. Um, I have to skip the whole section I had on data concerns. 
How many of you have had to do large migrations of old data into new systems? All right, I'm probably not gonna tell you much you didn't already know. The biggest thing was I was gonna talk about was how Unicode's a big pain in the ass, but Perl's got you covered as long as you read the documentation. Uh, final thoughts. Um, stop, yeah, I know. One more minute. Final thoughts then, um, you know, this increasingly I'm seeing, and I've said this before, more developers, more companies seem to be doing um, development in multiple languages at the same time. And I think that I think that should inform how we think about writing code, especially as we're changing it and hopefully keeping it useful in the future. And I think that means thinking about how someone who's both fairly new to Perl will see and understand your code, hopefully, and someone who, um, someone who has to maintain it after you. Um, and some of that means, you know, when I first got into Perl, everyone liked showing off about how succinctly you can, and simply you could do things in Perl, and that's kind of how we all know it got the reputation for being line noise, plus the fact that you use so many, you know, shift number symbols on the keyboard. Um, write once, read never. Well, yeah, right. The whole idea of, of you can write something really quick in Perl, but you can never hope to maintain it. And, you know, that, that's a reputation it really doesn't deserve because most code is actually something, once you get into it, you can understand. But I think we need to think about taking that to another level as code is, is rewritten and used again in the future because it's, I think it's gonna be far less common in the future for people approaching an old Perl code base who haven't already been there uh, to be spending most of their time in Perl. I think they're gonna be familiar with other languages. So we need to think about emphasizing features of the language and using them if they're common to other languages. It's something that's really specific and weird to Perl, think twice about using it because someone approaching it uh, from a lower experience point of view is just gonna find themselves stuck or confused. Um, so don't be clever, be clear and obvious. Um, the modern Perl stuff I think is great. I haven't had the luxury to put it in a lot of my code. Um, my only concern there is the fact that it's optional makes Perl seemed like a harder language for other people to approach. Um, I think that's more of a perception thing than a reality. It's, it's, it really comes down to how people are trained and taught and what the books they're getting are telling them, what the websites they're reading are telling them. So the last thing is I've been going to tech conferences now for 20 years. I don't know why they started at 8 a.m. So I thought of that last night at midnight when I was finishing my slides. <laughs> um, any comments or questions or, yes? That's a, that, that's a good point. And I, I've, I've found myself having to do that to my own code. When I write something, come back to it a year later to add a few features and have to relearn why something works a particular way. I've, why did I make that decision? Yeah, why is it that way? Or I, I assume it's that way for one reason. It turns out I was wrong. I add a comment there to remind my future self. And that's a great point. And I think I've also been a fan. I've, I've lobbied at a few organizations. I said, you know, I think we should have a part or full-time person on staff who's whose professional training is in technical documentation that can help us organize our wiki, get rid of the old crap, and make sure that our code is actually documented. It's never happened, but I've suggested it several times. <laughs> so no, I, I agree. I think that would be a great idea. Yes. Yes. So how does, if you have a QA team, how does writing tests for the code help? Um, another way of asking that is why should I write tests if the QA team is going to find the bug anyway? <laughs> um, I, so I think it, it, it's not an unreasonable question. I mean, honestly, I think, I think the reason, I think the way it helps is it shortens the time to discovery for a bug um, and also makes it, it narrows the, it, it narrows the search for trying to go find out where the source of the problem is in some cases. Um, the other thing I, th I think that having a lot of tests does for a code base, and I've seen this myself, um, I've worked in a code base where there were no tests 
literally no tests. And then a few years later, after someone was really dedicated and went in there and worked on that code base and added tests, there were thousands and thousands of tests. And the single biggest thing that did was to increase our confidence and our ability to make changes and not break too much. Like, we know most things are gonna work, and if something broke, oh, it's something that wasn't tested. Um, but I, I mean, I won't sugarcoat it. It's a huge investment to go through and add tests to an existing code base. It's hard, um, and it's, the, the biggest danger I see, well, there's two, two, two downsides. One is the, the sort of cost of doing that. It takes time to do that, and then you're committing to the maintenance of those tests for the foreseeable future. Um, the only other downside, really, is you end up with this, um, you could end up with this false sense of security. Now, well, now that we've got these thousands of tests, nothing's ever going to break, or if I make a change and the test suite passes, everything's good. Well, that's not always true either. Um, but it gets you a lot closer to that point than you were with no tests. Um, I think that the challenge is, the problem now is like if you don't have tests and QA finds a problem and it kicks back, it can take a long time to try to understand what they did to create the problem, what code might be responsible, and kind of conduct the search to find it. So that, that's my two cents on it. Which is exactly my OK. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? If not, I won't keep you from your snacks. Thank you very much.